Well, hey there. Uh, this is going to be our Bible study for the evening. Uh, I am joining you from a different location. I am in the sanctuary because uh, in order to do the live streaming, they had to change some stuff on the audio, and I got to figure out what to do to get it to where I can move the camera to other locations and still have audio because they changed that setting. And I didn't have audio when I recorded this the first time. So we're going to do it from here, and I know we'll have audio. But we are going to continue on. We're now into the book of Haggai. We finished up Habakkuk last week, and we're going to spend two weeks in the book of Haggai. And so this first week we're going to get through chapter 1 is the goal, and then next week we will look at chapter 2. But let us uh, begin with a word of prayer as we enter into this time. Lord God, thank you for this day and the blessings you've given us. Be with us as we go throughout this study of Haggai that we can search your will for us through these words and we can allow this prophet to speak to us where we are today. Be with each of us as we go throughout this study and let us examine our own lives in reference to the prophet and let us uh, be transformed through hearing his words. In Christ we pray, amen. And so as we begin, let us think of the historical context uh, the historical context of what's going on here in the book of Haggai, where, where this book takes place in the grand scheme of things. He is a post-exilic prophet. A post-exilic prophet means that they have returned from exile. And so really, if you're going to look at the... Uh, historical context and you want other books to look at the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and the very end of 2 Chronicles would be a good place to go to read in coordination with the book of Haggai. In fact, in 2 Chronicles it ends this way. It says, this is what the Cyrus the king of Persia says the Lord, the God of heavens, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Anyone of his people among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go help. And so the book of 2 Chronicle ends with the Persian king having taken over the Babylonian empire. That Persian king releases the exiles. He releases all those that are Jews to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. And the book that immediately follows 2 Chronicles is the book of of Ezra. And the book of Ezra picks up in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his reign, realm, and to put it in writing. And then it also lists out Cyrus's decree about building a temple in Jerusalem to the Lord. And so you can see how those two books closely interrelate when where Second Chronicles ends, Ezra picks up. And the reason I said Ezra is a good book to go read if you're going to read the book of Haggai is Haggai is in fact actually mentioned in the book of Ezra. If you look at uh, Ezra chapter 5, the very first book, verse, it says this. Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 says, Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Iddo, 
prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the Lord of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Jehu, son of Zodak, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem. The prophets of God were with them, helping them. And so this mentions Haggai and this mentions Zechariah, but we're focused on Haggai right now. And in fact, right here in Ezra chapter 5, this is where the book of Haggai picks up, is whenever they go to Jerusalem, when Haggai goes to Jerusalem and prophesies to them and helps motivate them to rebuild the temple. That's what a lot of the book of Haggai is about. That's what we're going to look at today. And so when we look uh, also, just so you know, Haggai is also mentioned in chapter 6, verse 14 as well, but I wasn't going to read that one to you. But again, you can see where Haggai is again mentioned in the book of Ezra. So we can easily place Haggai in that historical context of Ezra. But even without having that biblical reference, Haggai is one of those prophets that gives us a very clear understanding of when he wrote. Because when we get to Haggai chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shantil, the governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And so just by looking at that, he gives us that very certain time frame of when he is writing. And now I am not, in fact, he gets it down to the exact day. The first day of the month. Later on, he talks about the 24th day of the month. He, he talks about days all the time. Then on the 21st day of this month. and So he gives us very specific the exact dates. Now I am not a scholar that can go back and pull up the exact dates. However, we do have scholars that have done that. And the overwhelming scholarly evidence points to August 26th to December 18th of the year 520 B.C., is when Haggai was written, using those dates that uh, Haggai puts in here. So you're talking in about a three or four month period, you have the entire book of Haggai written. And in fact, the book of Haggai is largely a few uh, sermons, so to speak. I mean, that's basically kind of how they read. But they was written within about a four-month period in the year 520 B.C. And that is scholars using the dates that are mentioned throughout. But I want to go back and uh, just real quick, when we think of the post-exilic prophets, we have three, sometimes we count four. And so we do have Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi, the last three books of the Old Testament. But we also have Daniel. If you remember, Daniel's that funny one that he starts out in Babylonian, or he is taken at the very beginning of the book Daniel to Babylonian captivity, and then the Persians take over. And so you have Daniel kind of serving in both of these roles as both a pre-exilic and post-exilic prophet. But really, if we're talking about post-exilic prophets, we're usually probably talking about Haggai, Zechariah, or Malachi. And so, and another interesting thing that we do here is, like we have seen in other prophets like Hosea, Habakkuk didn't do it, but in Hosea he always relates the time that he is prophesying to a specific reign Who is king of Judah at this time? Who is king of Israel at this time? Well, here in Haggai, we have the same thing. And we also see this also in the book of Zechariah as well, uh, another post-exilic prophet, is that 
he doesn't use who's the king of Israel, who's the king of Judah. He is using who is the king of Persia. And so we're instantly reminded that while they were able to return to Israel, to build to Jerusalem, to rebuild that temple, they are still under foreign uh, rule of some sort. And we saw that here. But we also see that uh, verse 1, the last half of it, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Zeotiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Zodiac, the high priest. And so you see Haggai is taking this message essentially into the leadership of Israel, the human leadership of Israel. He has the governor of Judah there. He has the high priest there. And that is who he's initially talking to, the idea that he is going to talk to these people and these people will filter it out to the people. And so that's what we see happening here. And so in verse 2, let's pick up here. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. All right. Now, when we look at this title, Lord Almighty, that is actually one of those post-exilic preferred titles for God. You don't see it in tons of the prophecies for the most part, except for in the post-exilic, their preferred title is the Lord Almighty. And we also see here where the Lord Almighty lays out what the issue is. These people say the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Verse 3, then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. It is a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin. So the first thing the Lord says to Haggai, is it a time for you yourselves, the people of Israel, to be living in your paneled houses while the house remains a ruin. While this house remains a ruin. So when he talks about living in paneled houses, that actually kind of references back a little bit to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. It references back to that when David builds a palace and then he goes and he's essentially talking to Nathan and Nathan's talking for God. And... David says, you know, why is it I'm living here in this beautiful palace, but God is being relegated to a tent? And so now we kind of have the reverse of that going on here, where the people are content living in their paneled houses, in their finished, restored houses, their completed houses. They're content with that. Wow, God is living in ruins. The temple was destroyed, remember, when Babylon came in. And so they haven't really rebuilt much. If you read the book of Ezra, like I keep telling you you need to, if you read the book of Ezra, you'll see they started building it and they was motivated at the beginning and they built the foundation to the temple and then basically there came some conflict and they just stopped building. They just stopped and they started focusing on their own homes and things like that. Well, God here is calling them out for that. So here we are in verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put your clothes, you put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. 
Now, as we read this, I, we, I read this two different ways. Uh, you might pick one way over the other. I think it's a dual meaning here. And so the first way you certainly can read it is in reference to the curses of God as given in the book of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy. Specifically, when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28 has a lot of curses in it from God. And so if you turn to Deuteronomy 28 with me, we're going to look at some of those. In fact, we're just going to look at a few verses of it. But the curses really take up the vast majority of chapter 28. But if you look at 28, starting in verse 38, it says this. It says, You will sow much seed in the field, but you will harvest little, because locusts will devour it. You will plant vineyards and cultivate them, but you will not drink the wine or gather the grapes because worms will eat them. You will have olive trees throughout your country, but you will not use the oil because olives will drop off. You will have sons and daughters, but you will not keep them because they will go into captivity. Swarms of locusts will take over all your trees and crops of your land. And so the first way to read this is to read it as if this is still a curse from God, as if the people are still not doing what God wants. And so even though this was used a lot in the pre-exilic prophets saying, you're not going to harvest what you, you plant, you're not, the fruit's going to be barren, things like that. But here... It's saying, well, guess what? We said it in the pre-exilic times, and now it's starting all over again because you're still not doing what you're told. And so that's certainly a valid way to read it. I do think there's a double meaning here, though, like I said. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but have never enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. These people, much like the issue in the book of Ecclesiastes, the author of Ecclesiastes addresses this a little bit, but it's brought up here again. These people are unsatisfied. They cannot find contentment in their material well, they need more and more and more. And they can't find that contentment. And so they are so focused on their selves and their resources and their houses that they're not thinking of God and God's houses. House. And so I see a dual meaning here as we go through this. And now we get here to verse 7. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Now let's stop there. That's actually the second time we've read that. We read it also in verse 5. Give careful thought to your ways. Give careful thought to the way you're living your life. Give careful thought to your priorities in life. What you are doing. Verse 8. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. I didn't bring up, uh, I'm going to have to use my phone, I didn't bring up a translation that I actually wanted. But uh, most Bible translations actually say something like this. Go up into the hills and bring down timber and build your house. They say a lot of things similar to that, or go up into the mountains like this one says. I actually don't think that's the easiest translation to make. Because mountains or hills, as most of those translations say, it's in fact singular. So it's go up into the mountain and bring down timber and build your house is what you would have to read. 
But we know the hills or the mountains that are around Jerusalem. Yes, they have some timber, but they don't have a lot of timber. They don't have high quality timber. They would not really have what you would use to build a temple. And so how can we understand this? Well, let's look at Ezra chapter 3 again. Man, look at that. You could read Ezra and you could get a lot out of this book, huh? Ezra chapter 3, starting in verse 7. This is talking about rebuilding the temple. And it says, Then they gave money to the masons and the carpenters, and they gave food and drink and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre, so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus the king of Persia. So where did all this cedar come from in rebuilding the temple? It didn't come from locally around Jerusalem, the mountains. It came from a long distance, shipped overseas and things like that. So how can we read this along with Ezra 3, 7? Well, in fact, I think the King James does a really good job of this translation and makes it a lot easier for us to understand. And so I'm using my phone here to pull up Haggai 1.8 in the King James. It says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. Okay. So they're not going up to the mountains, getting timber and bringing it back. The way it's translated here in the King James is go up to the mountain. Remember, if you, well, you might not know, but in Jerusalem, it's high ground anyways. The temple sits on the highest point of Jerusalem, and often that is considered a mountaintop. It, when we're talking, they're going up to Jerusalem, they're going up high, high and things like that. And so he is talking about go up to that plateau where the temple used to stand and take Wood with you. Again, King James, go up to the mountain and bring wood. You are bringing wood with you up to the mountain and you build the house there. And so that is how Ezra 3 7 and Haggai 1 8 make sense together. And so I'm going to say a lot of those translations are kind of missing that. And you, what you end up doing is you have a conflict in Scripture that does not necessarily have to be there if you truly understand this as mountain being singular and that they are bringing the timber with them to that mountain for building. And so I just wanted to spend some time and labor on that a little bit. And so let's continue on now. In verse, we just finished 8. Well, no, we didn't finish 8. So go up into the mountain and bring down timber and build your house. We Build the house. We've already talked about that. So that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. Now, it tells us in Scripture that God withdrew Himself from Solomon's temple, from that first temple that was built. He had withdrew Himself. And so now we have an image of Him coming back and dwelling in this place and being honored in this place. Verse 9. God speaking, he says, You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house, therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grains, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces 
on men and cattle and on the labor of your hands. And so again, we have this idea earlier in verses 5 through 6, we have God implicit, uh, implying that He has withdrawn. You know, it talks about you have planted much, you've harvested little, you eat, but you're ne you never have enough, you drink, all that. Well, now you have God explicitly saying that He actually did, in fact, He is, in fact, doing that as a curse, as a punishment because of how the returning Jews were acting. They were caring about themselves and their homes and not God's home. Now, one of the things that is important to see here is economically, they didn't have tons of resources. This was not as if they were living high and mighty with millions of dollars in mansions. It's not what's going on here. But they were living and getting along and trying to do the best they can, and they were neglecting God. Now this is actually kind of interesting when you think about those pre-exilic prophets. When we look at Isaiah chapter 1, or when we look at Amos, or we can look at a lot of different places, and we talked about that... Uh, they were being going through rituals. They was doing rituals. They was observing these things. But they weren't honoring God in their lives by their worship of their life. They was performing the rituals at church or at the temple. But they weren't living as change transformed people outside of it. Well, here... God was, in, or in the post-exilic, a lot of times God's emphasizing, I'm tired of all these sacrifices if you're not going to live right. Well, now in the post-exilic, the people are living and they're not doing any of the ritualistic stuff. They're, they're ignoring that part of it. And so you have a balancing here where God's saying, okay, well, before you were trying to just live your lives and you, you weren't living right, you weren't living godly, you were just giving me sacrifices. I didn't want that. But now you're not doing anything ritual. You're not building a relationship with me. You're just living. I don't want that either. And again, they weren't... They didn't have tons of money or anything like that. And so this was not an issue of the rich get richer kind of thing where people were trying to hoard onto their money. It seems as if they was just trying to survive. Uh, we see that here when we recognize that they're going through droughts at the time and things like that, that people, they didn't have tons of money. But let's keep going here. In verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shephtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Well, let's finish it and then I'll come back. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord, of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty their God. And on the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year, oh, and they did this on the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year of King Darius. And so in the course of 24 days, Haggai goes and speaks to the leaders, and then he speaks to the people, and in the course of 24 days, they start working to rebuild the temple. 
It reminds me again of that Ezra chapter 5 verse 1 where it said that the prophet Haggai came and they started rebuilding. Well, here you go. You see that here as well. Now, one of the things that you see, it's actually mentioned twice here where it talks about the whole remnant of the people. Uh, yeah, the whole remnant of the people. It's mentioned in verse 12. It's mentioned in verse uh, 15. No, verse 14. It talks about the whole remnant of the people. The remnant of Israel, the remnant of the people, is very important in prophecy. We see it in Isaiah a lot where Isaiah talks about the remnant. So essentially they're talking about the true believers, the true church, the true followers of God. That's what they're often talking about, that those people that go through all the trials and temptations, they go through the dis the uh, being uh, exiled and things like that, and yet they're still faithful. There's the remnant of Israel. And so that is what we're talking about here. The remnant, those that have come back, and those that are still faithful to God, is who uh, they start talking to here. And you see that unlike... A lot of the pre-exilic prophets, in fact, all the pre-exilic prophets, the prophet proclaims what's going on. God is not happy with you because this is what you're doing. This is what you need to start doing. In pre-exilic prophecy, that didn't really ever affect anything. And yet in the post-exilic, as you read Ezra, Nehemiah, as you read Haggai, you recognize that when those people preach or prophesy or teach, the people listen and they change their ways. Within just a short period of time, 24 days, they go from being all about them and not worried about the house of God to suddenly dedicating a lot of time and effort to rebuilding the house of God, importing cedar from all over the known world in order, from Lebanon, in order to build the new temple. This is a labor-intensive type thing. And yet, in just a short period of time, the prophet speaks and the people listen to what God had said through that prophet. And that's one of those things you'll see throughout the pre, uh, post-exilic prophets as well as Ezra and Nehemiah. You will see this idea more so of the people reforming, the people turning towards God instead of ignoring the prophets. And so that gets us through chapter 1 of Haggai. As I promised, we did make it all the way through. Uh, we are going to look at chapter 2 next week, and then the following week I'm going to have a fun little uh, additional class where I just make some stuff up and I tell you about it. So uh, let us close tonight with a word of prayer. Or God... Thank you for this book of Haggai. Thank you for this prophet that boldly preaches, that tells us that we need to ensure that God is our priority, that no matter what the world gives us, we'll never be satisfied without God. And whether we have a lot or a little, what we have should be for your work and your will. Let us never forget that. In Christ we pray. Amen.